Please turn with me then to the book of the Song of Solomon. And in chapter 4, where we left off uh, three weeks ago now, is it? Since uh, we were in this book. So, chapter 4. I'm just going to read the opening 11 verses of the chapter. And then we'll go from there. This, we take... Um, of this, this part of the book, these very verses that we're looking at tonight, we take as being the words of the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bride of the Church, as he speaks to his people. Before I do read, let me just remind you that this whole book is an allegory. In other words, it's a kind of poetic book that has a meaning behind it that is far deeper than appears on the surface. And the best way of understanding this book is to think of it in terms of the experience that the church, or narrowing it down to individual Christians, because what is a church but a church is made up of individual believers, the experiences that the believer has, the church has, in relation to her Saviour. Now, in the, in the scriptures, of course, you have repeated references to this bridegroom and bride relation uh, that is between the church and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we went through all of this when we started to look at the book, if you can cast your memories back that far. Um, Ephesians 5, just as one example, um, the, the, the marriage um, picture there given the, the, the man and the woman and the, the bridegroom and the bride. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it and so forth. And, and so we have this imagery running through the scriptures and it's all there in the Song of Solomon. That's the way to understand it. It's a kind of dialogue almost that, that is between Christ on the one hand and the believer on the church on the other hand. And the difficulty can be sometimes, you might remember making this comment, the difficulty can be to ascertain who it is that's speaking at any particular time. But in chapter 4, it seems very, very clear that this is language, poetic language, that, that has to do with how the Saviour regards his people, how the bridegroom looks upon his bride, his church, every one of his believing people. So now let me just read the opening 11 verses. The Saviour speaks. Have that in your mind as we read. Behold, thou art fair, my love. You're a believer? That's you. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. Thy teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn, which came up from the washing whereof every one bear twins, and none is barren among them. Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet, and thy speech is comely. Thy temples are like a piece of a pomegranate within thy locks. Thy neck is like the flower of David, builded for an armory, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins, which feed among the lilies. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, I will get me to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Shina and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse. How much better is thy love than wine, and the smell of thine ointments than all spices. Thy lips, O oh my spouse, drop as the honeycomb, honey and milk, are under thy tongue, and the smell of thy garments is like the smell of Lebanon. 
Well, we'll leave it there. When we were here three weeks ago, we didn't get as far as I intended to get with all of this. And we began to look at some of these characteristics that Christ particularly admires in his church. That's what these opening verses are about, verses 1 and through to verse 7. We looked, I won't go through all of this again, but we looked at what he says about the, the bride's eyes and about the bride's hair and about the bride's teeth and about the bride's lips. Now, all of this is poetic, and um, if you can't remember what was said three weeks ago, and I wouldn't blame you if you didn't remember it all, but it's there on the internet site, so you can brush up and, uh, and look at it there. But what we're going to do this evening is to go on from, in this, this passage from verse 3, and at the end, where the Saviour speaks of the temples of his bride. Thy temples are like a piece of a pomegranate within thy locks. Now, what is to be made of that, you may ask? What kind of spiritual reality lies behind this allegorical picture? Temples, as we know, are a very vulnerable part of the head and therefore sensitive. If you look into the book of Judges, you'll find that it's through the temple that Jael, a character called Jael, must have killed another character called Sisera with a nail. She took a nail, probably a tent peg, and drove that nail through this man's head as he slept on the ground. Pretty gruesome kind of an account, but that's what the Bible reveals. And so it's the sensibility, the, the vulnerability of the temple that seems to be the, 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 the main issue here. And the Lord Jesus says to his bride, thy temples are like a piece of pomegranate within thy locks. As the Saviour looks at his bride, he looks at the temples and it seems to me that the meaning here is that he recognises that there's a sensitivity in his bride that he admires. She feels a vulnerability in a spiritual kind of way. Now, when we try and open that up a little bit, I'm sure that we'll begin to understand what, what I'm driving at. Do you feel vulnerable to temptation? Could it get you? Well, it does get us, doesn't it? And this is it. And yet, when that temptation seems to strike, we immediately think, do we not, that this temptation could lead me to dishonour the Lord. And I'm not only vulnerable to temptation, I feel sensitive to doing anything that might dishonour my God and my Saviour. What great harm could be done to me as a Christian, to the church and its reputation, and to the honour of God. And the Lord looks down upon his bride, looks down upon his people, and he sees this, and it's something, strangely, that he admires. This is wonderful to him. Because, you see, when we're not converted, when there's no grace in us, we don't care very much about sin. We don't even recognise what sin is. We think of things that we might get caught for, and things that we might be rebuked for, and things that we might suffer loss because of, but we don't relate our behaviour and our own, own spiritual life within us to the holiness of God. But you see, when the grace of God comes upon us, everything is related to the Lord. And we feel our vulnerability, we sense our, 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 our helplessness at times, and we think of our Lord and... When we do that, the Saviour recognises that this is something that is a work of his grace and he delights to see it. But look on in that verse at the end. Thy temples are like a piece of a pomegranate within thy locks. Now, what does that suggest? Well, some of the old writers 
And I have to say, you have to look to the old writers to really get to, to, uh, to, 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 to understand something of all of this. There are so many modern writers that comment on the Solomon, Song of Solomon in a very unworthy and unspiritual and irreverent way. I've mentioned that to you before. But some of the old writers think in terms of this. A pomegranate, a piece of pomegranate, no less. How do you get a piece of pomegranate? You break it. And when you pay, break a piece of pomegranate open, what do you see? A kind of reddish colour. So the idea seems to be that the temples are very linked with the cheeks. This is all about blushing. A blushing in his bride, the blushing bride. Not for the reasons that we might think of in our day, but this opened fruit and red as in a time of blushing. Why does a Christian blush? When would a Christian blush? Well, we would blush at actual committed sin. There's a passage in the Old Testament where the, the man praying, I think it's Ezra in actual fact, I'd have to check that, but I think it's Ezra, the top of my head, we blush to lift up our face unto heaven. We felt like that at times, haven't we? Like the man in the temple that Jesus described, the, the tax collector, the publican, who would not dare to lift up his face to heaven because he was so conscious of his sinfulness. We blush at sin committed. We might blush at the approach of sin, the thought of failing our Saviour. But isn't there another way in which we might blush? At the forgiveness of Christ? That he might forgive me for what I am and for what I have done? And yet all of this, you notice, at the end of verse 3, a piece of pomegranate within thy locks. Within the hair that hangs down like a, a curtain, as it were, over the head of the bride. So this blushing is concealed. Now, what does that mean? What does that suggest to us? That this is not something that is just done in public. This is a private blushing at the thought of sin and the thought of the grace of God toward us. See, there's a difference, isn't there? It's so horribly possible to put on a show in public, to make men or to let men think that we're, we're so pious and we're so righteous and we're so godly, and yet we can be very different in private. And shame upon us for that, but that's how it can be. But what Christ delights to see, is this is all the qualities that he's admiring in his people, what Christ delights to see is not the public show of religion, but that which is secret and hidden, when it's in the heart. And there's no religion at all unless that religion is in the heart. This is what Christ loves to see. A Christian who knows their vulnerability, sensitive to the approach of sin, blushing at the thought of sin or even the actual committed sin, he doesn't like to see the hardened heart and the willful person that goes on in their sin. Well, this is another attribute of the bride that Christ delights in. But there's the neck, verse 4. I must move on more quickly. The neck, thy neck is like the Tower of David, builded for an armory, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Well, what's so significant about the neck? Well, what does the neck serve to do? What does your neck do for you? Well, it joins your body, doesn't it, with your head, in a simple kind of way. Well, if Christ is the head of the church, and the church is the body, the body of Christ, what is it that joins the head with the body? What is it joins us with our Saviour? Well, it's our faith, isn't it? our faith in the grace and in the goodness of God. And what the Lord says here is that thy neck is like the tower of David 
Build it for an armory, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. This is a picture of military strength, of great defence, and the obvious picture there, surely, is that what Christ delights to see in his people is a strong faith. A strong faith. The Tower of David, builded for an armory, is a picture of strong faith. You know, the kind of faith that does not soon give way. Under pressure and in the time of difficulty, the Lord likes to see a faith that is strong, that doesn't soon capitulate under pressure. You know how it is. I see the enemy, I see the problems, I see the troubles, I see the trials coming. Ah, but my faith sees my Saviour. My faith lays hold upon his promises. And this is what the Lord delights to see. Bucklers and shields. Remember in, in uh, the, the New Testament letters, the shield of faith. The buckler is a kind of small shield and the shield itself is a, is a larger version of that. And what does the shield of faith do? It protects the heart of spiritual life. And we need a strong faith. What use is a, a faith that is a weak faith? As soon as there is a problem, we fly into a panic, we, 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 we droop, we think it's all up with us. But strong faith lies hold upon the power of God and the promises of God. And this is what the Lord likes to see. And he admires it when he does find it in his people. And then verse 5, Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins, which feed among the lilies. What's this a picture of? Well, it's surely the picture of a mother who feeds her young. Now then, the church and believers in the church, and especially we would have to say the, the, the preaching ministry in the church, is for what? It's for feeding the flock. Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, and so on. And the, the picture seems to me to be here is that Christ loves to see his people when they are able to feed their young. We don't have that many young here. We have some very young, and they're fed. They're fed in their homes, as Christian homes, and they're fed when they come into the Sunday school that we have before the morning service. We would to God that we had a queue of young people at the doors every week. Maybe the Lord will send them along one of these days. We pray that he will. But we want to feed the young. But there are others who are young in a different way. Young in the faith. And we sometimes are able to welcome people that haven't been Christians for too long. And there's an experience of saving grace that they've known. We praise God for that. But they come and we're pleased to welcome them and they want feeding. And they want feeding because they're hungry. And they need feeding because without that satisfying of a hunger, they will remain as infants and as babes. And so a great part of the function of the Church of Jesus Christ is to be in fulfilment of this imagery here, thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins which feed among the lilies, a feeding ministry that strengthens people's faith, that shows them the glory of their God, that reminds them constantly of all the, the saving grace that is to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Examples of faith in the scripture. Everything that is given to us in the word of God that is for our spiritual good and our lasting blessing. It's not just the young, whether young in years or young in spiritual experience that need feeding. Everyone does. Somebody might have been a Christian for 50 years or 60 years or 70 years or 80 years or whatever it might be. You need, still need feeding. You need feeding in an ordinary way, in a physical way. Show me a nursing home with people that are 80, 90 years old and they lie in their beds because that's all they can do. Are they not fed in their bodies? Of course they are. 
And show me a Christian who's been a believer for 80 years or whatever it might be. Do they need feeding? Of course they do. And I say this as well. Don't they want feeding? Yes, they do. The more we have, the more we want. We can overdo it in terms of ordinary food. You can't overdo it in feeding upon the Word of God. The more we have, the better we are. And I tell you this, the more that we have, the more we want. And the more we have, the better we are for it. It's always the way. But there's something else that's important here. Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins, which feed among the lilies. In other words, the mother picture here is a picture of a mother who herself feeds. Among the lilies, if you go back to chapter 2 and verse 16, you'll find that that's where Christ feeds his people. There's a picture there of going to where Christ feeds his people. So how is it that a Christian, or if you like, a Sunday school teacher, or a minister of the Word of God, or the church generally, or any Christian, how is it that we can feed the young, or feed others that have no knowledge, or feed others that need encouraging or comforting? How is it we can do that? Only if we ourselves first are feeding upon the Word of God. Now, I've never been a mother. I am a father. And I don't know all the ins and outs of these things. I don't pretend to. And in a way, I don't want to. But what I do know is that my wife, when our children were in the making, so to speak, well, her appetite didn't decrease. And it can't, can it? Because... The mother needs feeding. And so do we. How can we help anybody if we're weak? How can we help every, anybody if we don't know? How can we point anyone in the spiritual life if we're not there ourselves? We have to feed ourselves. And when we feed ourselves, then we're in the position to help others along the way. And this is what Christ loves to see. Now then, following all of this, we have in verse 6, I mentioned this three weeks ago, but let me mention it quickly again today. I'm going to have to do something about that clock. It goes far too fast. But look at verse 6. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, I will get me to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. Now you remember, or you may remember, that what I said three weeks ago is that that is a, a statement that tells us that Christ remembers the prayers of his people. Because if you look back in chapter 2 and verse 17, what does the bride say? What does the Christian say? Having lost contact, if you like, with her bridegroom, the Christian, out of communion, with her saviour or his saviour and she's restored and she prays in verse 17 of chapter 2 until the day break and the shadows flee away turn my beloved and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bethel and in short what that means is until the day break until heaven comes until the end of his age dawns be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bethel. Without going into all of the detail here, what she's praying for is that so long as she's in this world, may the Saviour come to her again and again and again because she did not like and she mourned over the absence of her Saviour from her heart and life. Always come until the day break and the shadows flee away. Those words. Now look into chapter 4. And verse 6. Until the day break. And the shadows flee away. You see the point? She prayed. He heard. And he remembers what she said. 
until the day break and the shadows flee away, I will get me to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. In other words, I'm now answering your prayer. And I'm going to show you how your prayer is going to be fulfilled. Until heaven dawns, until for the, as long as you are in this world, I will get me to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. Where is that? Or if you like, what is that? Well, frankincense and myrrh are those spices that were very much associated with prayer. They were spices that were used with incense in the offerings unto God. And incense is always associated with the rising, if you like, the rising of prayer unto God. Where does prayer arise unto God? Where is worship made? In two principal places, or three really. First is in what Jesus described as being the closet in Matthew chapter 6. Go into your closet, you remember that? Private prayer. The believer alone with her saviour. Prayer arises, worship arises, privately and secretly unto the saviour. Where else? In family worship. Where a family is gathered together and the scriptures are read and prayer is offered in the family. And then of course, in the public worship of the local church, where prayer and worship is offered unto God. Remember that when the money changers and all the um, blasphemous things were going on there in the temple, in the days of the Lord Jesus, he goes out and overturns the tables and drives the money changers out. And do you remember what he said about the temple? My house is a house of prayer. And you've turned it into a den of thieves. And the point of all of this is that Christ is to be found when his people worship him. And in particular, I would say, in church gatherings. The local church is appointed by him as the place for worship for fellowship with himself. There will I be in the midst, he said. Fellowship with other believers is the whole nature of the church. And fellowship in mutual love. So the idea briefly seems to be again that you want to meet with me. You want to know fellowship with me. You don't want to live apart from me. Well, I'll tell you where I will be found and I will be found in the place of prayer and of worship, in your closet, in your family, and in your church, until the day break. Until the day breaks, the day of heaven, the great heavenly age that is to, to come. In other words, for the whole span of a believer's life in this world, Christ is to be found in worship. And he calls us to come to be where he is to be found. Verse 8. Come with me, he says. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. With me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Shina and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. Come with me. This is a call that comes from the bridegroom to his bride or from Christ to his church or from Christ to each and every believer to come from Lebanon. Now, what's the significance of that? You have to keep asking these questions, otherwise you, don't, you, you, you miss the point of the book. Lebanon was said to be a most pleasant and attractive place you would find there tall, impressive cedars and sweet-smelling flowers. It would have been a lovely place to be. 
You know, you think about your favourite place in the countryside on a, on a warm summer's day, not latter part of August when everything's dried up, but the early part of summer when it's all at its best. And then you think of Lebanon, a pleasant, lovely place. Amarna, otherwise known as Abana. That was the place of Naaman's preferred river. Do you remember him, the leper? Go and wash in the Jordan. I don't want to go and wash in the Jordan, he said. Um, why can't I wash in Amarna? It's a much better river than, than, than your river. But that wouldn't do. But that was the river, the river par excellence, as far as many people were concerned. Sheena and Hermon, vantage points overlooking various parts of the land of Canaan. All very attractive. This is the point. All very lovely. Where you would want to be if you were just a worldly-minded people. Not sinful, necessarily. Just very pleasant and very appealing. But there's a problem there. If you look at the end of the verse. From the lion's dens and from the mountains of the leopards. It might have been very pleasant and attractive, but there were dangers there. Lions were there. Leopards were there. And while you're standing there admiring the cedars and smelling the sweet-smelling flowers and all the rest of it, you could never be sure that there wouldn't be a lion that was looking at you, or a leopard that had you in its sights. Now here's the point. There might be very lawful and wonderful pleasant things that we can enjoy in this world. But this world can be a dangerous place. We're not necessarily talking about sins as such, but to be caught up with and to be taken over by worldly pleasures can be a very dangerous thing because behind them all lies the lion and the leopard. Satan, who prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And the warning here, or the call here, is come from that. Come from that kind of life, that kind of position, whereby the world is too important for you. I've told you this before, but I can't think of another illustration off the top of my head. That when we moved from one place to another, when I first went into the ministry, there in South London, we changed doctor's surgeries. And this very well-meaning nurse said, you need to take more exercise, Mr Saunders. And so I took that seriously. And um, I went out and I bought a tracksuit and some trainers. And I started on this um, exercise program, jogging. That's my, my plan, to go jogging around the park um, in the mornings. And um, the first morning, I distinctly remember it, I just made, about, just about made it to the end of the road before I was calling for the oxygen tent. But as it went on, the stamina increased, and um, there we are. I was, it was about a three-mile run, and I was breezing around this, and I was thoroughly enjoying it. Then I found myself thinking, well, maybe I could stretch this. It was a three-mile run. Maybe I could make it five. And then if I'd made it five, I could have thought, well, I could have made it ten. But how much of a chunk of the day would that taken out? And then it sort of a fleeting thought came into my mind. What about the marathon? Twenty-six miles. Could I train myself up to run twenty-six miles? Ah, oh, but you see, when's the London Marathon run? On a Sunday, you see. My point is that something very appealing, very lawful in itself, even advisable, can become something that just takes you over. And that's the problem with even the legitimate things of the world. And the Saviour says to his bride, Come with me from Lebanon. Do we want real heart communion with Christ? Do we really want the blessings that he has to give? 
Do we really believe that they are so wonderful? And that by our foolishness, if not by our outright sinfulness, we can forfeit all of that. And we can be impoverished because of all of that. And Christ says, come with me from Lebanon. Do we think that we will lose by this? That there can't be anything that competes with Lebanon because the cedars are so tall and the flowers are so sweet smelling and the views are so wonderful. Do we think that Christ cannot provide something that is better than that? Do we not think that spiritual communion with him is the most wonderful experience that can be possibly had in this world? Come with me, he says. Thou art all fair, my love. Verse 7, he repeats what he said at the beginning. There is no spot in thee. He looks down upon us tonight. And this morning was about the atonement and the covering of the blood of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, and he he knows that our faith is in him as a sacrifice for sin. And by virtue of that, all the spots that are ours have been removed. Our sins and our guilt have been laid upon that scapegoat and it's been taken off into a land uninhabited. And it's all gone. And he looks down upon us and he sees us as washed and clean and forgiven and pardoned and right. And he says of us, there is no spot in thee. And he says, come with me. How can a holy God say of a sinner, there is no spot in thee, come with me. It's grace, isn't it? The forgiving grace of God in Jesus Christ who has loved us from eternity and loved us while we were in our sin and sent Christ to die for us when we were in our sin, that all the spots and blemishes and sins and disgrace that's true of us might be removed and that he can put his grace into us that makes us to be like the bride that described in this very chapter. Things about us Graces that belong to us, that even God himself looks down and says, I love you and I love to see what my spirit has produced in you. It's a marvel of grace. It's a wonder of mercy that we should be so treated and so viewed in the way that we are. When we hear words like this, Thou art fair, that word means beautiful. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. There is no spot in thee. We might be tempted to turn around and say to the Lord, you can't be talking about me. Maybe someone else, but not me. But it is you. It is you. And why do we know that? Because by the blood of Christ, all that's offensive and all that's sinful and a token of our rebellion against him is gone. And he sees his own righteousness upon us. And that's why he can say most truthfully and most wonderfully what he does. This book the more I look at it and the more I seek to understand its meaning is a book that fills me with awe and wonder at the love and the grace of God which is utterly unmerited. But then that's grace. If there was any merit in us, it wouldn't be grace. But it is grace from start to finish and to think that the Lord looks upon us 
in ways like this is just breathtaking. Well, as predicted, we haven't got to the end of my plan, so we'll have to return to this next time round, where we'll see that there are these various kinds of reassurances of the sincerity of the love of Christ toward us. We might be going away tonight and saying, well, can this be real? Is he, is he, has he got this right? Are we looking at this in the right way? Oh yes we are, because when we go on from here, we shall see more of just how the, the Lord is anxious, so to speak, or concerned would be a better word, to reassure us of his most definite and perfect love toward us. And we'll have to wait until next time for that. But may the Lord bless these things to us. Amen.